Good morning to people uh, joining from across the Atlantic. Thank you for making time for this important topic. Uh, I hope everybody can see my screen. Seems so. Uh, so micromobility was a, a hot topic in uh, many countries uh, before the coronavirus crisis uh, developed. Now, uh, let me make sure. Yes, now micromobility is again on the agenda. Cities like Bogota, Milan, and Brussels and others are making radical changes to uh, the use of public space. This is to, to, to help people cycle more. Uh, and the goal is to maintain safe distances between, between people in public transport, but also to prevent car traffic congestion. If you want to read more about the need to redistribute road space in response to COVID, go to the ITF uh, website and find the latest ITF briefing in the COVID series. Uh, it's called Respacing Our Cities for Resilience, and my colleagues will, will share a link in the chat window for you. But back to our report on safe micromobility. In this presentation, I will start with definitions. Then in about 10 minutes, I will take you through a quick summary of what we found. And in 10 minutes after that, I will present the 10 recommendations this report is making. So to, to start and to talk about the safety of micromobility, we must define it. What is micromobility and what are micro vehicles? We see rapid innovation in, in design. Inventors create completely new types of vehicles. Some people call it new form factors, a term which is often used in the smartphone and other portable electronics industry. Innovation will continue. A definition of micromobility based on the vehicle types we know today will be out of date tomorrow. In case you are not yet convinced, have a look on the internet for personal mobility devices. So what we need is a flexible definition, including a wide range of vehicle types, a definition that is future-proof. Uh, we propose to define micromobility as, as follows, as uh, a micro vehicle as one with a maximum speed, no higher than 45 kilometers an hour, and with a mass no higher than 350 kilograms. And when you combine those two criteria together, what you do is that you limit the kinetic energy of the micro vehicle. Uh, this being said, it creates a wide definition. Some people believe that a 350 kilogram vehicle is too heavy to be called micro. So what we do is we propose to separate different classes of micro vehicles in a way which again, we hope to make future proof. And so speed is for us the most important criteria for safety. We have published many reports on, many reports on speed. So we propose to separate on, on one side vehicles which are unpowered or powered up to 25 kilometers an hour and on the other side, vehicles which are capable of reaching up to 45 kilometers an hour. You can combine that with the second criteria, uh, which is the weight of the vehicle. And when you combine both criteria, you get four types of vehicles, A, B, C, and D. You will often hear me talk about uh, low speed micro mobility. I will be referring to types A and B together when I use this term. So when you hear me say low speed, think less than 25 kilometers an hour. Now, and before I move on, do you see the bicycle logo uh, to the left here? Uh, this is to remind everyone that micromobility does include cycling and other forms of human powered mobility, such as skateboards or traditional kick scooters. Let's move on now from definitions to findings. The question is: the question uh, everyone is asking is, is it safe? Uh, I'll start with cycling safety because ITF has produced much research in this field over the years before I move on to, to e-scooters. So with cycling, we are able to calculate the risk of uh, being killed on a bike in each city on this map. 
uh, the risk is represented by different colors and it is controlling for how many kilometers you travel. I will take just one minute here to comment on this map. Uh, as you see, the risk can vary a lot between cities. It varies by a factor of 10 from one city to another. So there is no such thing, no such concept as the risk of cycling. Even an average across cities will always depend on which cities we choose to include in that basket of cities. This is to say that measuring the risk of one mode of transport is nothing easy. It depends on where you look. Uh, you may also ask, where is this data coming from? Uh, the answer is that mainly from the ITF Safer City Streets Network that was mentioned earlier by, by my colleagues. Uh, it's a network and database, and uh, you will uh, now see a link in the, in the chat window if you want to have a look at the, the benchmarking report that we produced. This map shows the extent of the ITF Safer City Streets Network involving close to 50 cities. It, it was initiated by the ITF IATAD group, which is the permanent working group on road safety at the, at the ITF, and it is now funded by the FIA. Uh, please feel free to contact me via email for any question on safer city streets. But we just talked about cycling risk. Now, what about e-scooters? You probably want to know more about that. How do they compare with bicycles? So we looked for recent medical publications for reports from local governments, for news articles, we came to the following conclusions. With regards to the risk of death of a rider uh, controlling for the number of trips, we found no difference in the risk um, between e-scooters and bicycles. Uh, we found, however, that uh, the risk of being killed is five times higher if you make a trip on a motorcycle. Now, what about injuries? There are several ways of counting traffic injuries. We looked at two indicators only. The first one is the number of admissions to a hospital bed. Here, the risk appears significantly higher on an e-scooter in comparison to riding a bicycle. One limitation of our finding is that only two studies were available to document this risk. So conclusions are certainly provisional. Another indicator uh, we looked at is the number of uh, emergency department visits. Here the risk is the same for e-scooter riders and for cyclists. Our findings on both uh, fatality and injury risks are based on the few pieces of evidence available, sometimes very few. Not only that, we also found weaknesses in many of those pieces of evidence. So we call for more research and we make recommendations to improve data collection. Could it be that this report underestimate the true risk of riding an e-scooter? Maybe. Uh, we are certainly calling for a continuation of research efforts and uh, we have reasons to believe that the risk of riding an e-scooter is uh, anyway very likely to fall over time. Here is a graph showing the number of crashes reported to uh, a selection of e-scooter companies. Over time the crash per trip ratio goes down, people gain experience people stop seeing e-scooters as a toy, but as a true mean of transport. Cities learn to make space for protect, to protect those, those new vulnerable road users. So to summarize the last few slides, I would like to say we found no major difference between bicycles and shared e-scooters with regards to risk. Um, in earlier research, the ITF had already found no major difference in risk between bicycles and low-speed e-bikes. So I can see a pattern here. Um, this report considers that low-speed micro-vehicles, and I insist on the word low-speed, um, those vehicles are considered as safe as bicycles. Now together, let's take one step back from micro-mobility and compare the safety of five modes of transport. 
On this chart, we plot the risk of a person being killed when making a trip, taking averages from cities member of the ITF Safer City Streets Network. Um, that risk of being killed is, is greatest if you ride a motorcycle or a moped. Uh, this is the power two-wheeler category here. The risk is, is far highest. Shifting those trips to uh, pedal cycles or e-scooters would save lives. Could shifting people into passenger cars also save lives? The chart suggests yes. Uh, in fact, something is missing on this chart. The number of people killed outside of the vehicle. So we've added this information to the chart. This is the gray bar. Only the gray bar uh, that corresponds to fatalities in other user groups. Only then can we see the true footprint of a car trip in a dense urban environment. Only then can we see the benefit in road safety terms of uh, shifting, of a mode shift towards, towards walking, towards uh, cycling, towards e-scooters and towards public transport. So we are talking about mode shift as something that is essential to make a city safer. But what is the actual effect of e-scooters on this point? Are they just shifting people from public transport? In which case, uh, the safety effect may not be positive. In the US, um, in fact, up to 50% of shared e-scooter trips are replacing car, taxi, or motorcycle trips. In Europe, it is uh, up to 20%, it is lower. Uh, other trips uh, made by e-scooters essentially come from walking and public transport. Uh, in spite of that, for the vast majority of city officials we talked with, micromobility is a solution in a, in a toolkit, in a broader toolkit, to reduce car use in cities. Cities hope that micromobility can solve the last mile problem, which is often what makes public transport fail. They hope to connect micromobility with uh, public transport stations. Uh, but the question is, could mode shift towards micromobility create a virtuous circle and make micromobility safer? Uh, the answer is probably yes, because our research reveals that a motor vehicle is involved in 80% of bicycle and e-scooter death. Having less motor vehicles on the road would uh, make micromobility safer, more attractive, and further reduce car use, therefore closing the circle. But what about pedestrians? didn't mention uh, the risk of a micro vehicle crashing with a pedestrian yet. Uh, they can be injured or killed in such crashes. Uh, pedestrian uh, represents less than 10% of victims in crashes involving e-scooters or bicycles. Some would say this is a relatively small number, smaller than public opinion may believe, and smaller than the proportion of pedestrian victims in car crashes in any case. But I would argue pedestrian safety is paramount. A lot is at stake. First uh, is the well being of a population, which is aging in many countries. Second is the future of walking as one of the healthiest, affordable, most inclusive forms of mobility. So this report proposes to seriously limit or ban the use of micro vehicles on sidewalks but how to make sure that people will respect this rule and avoid riding on sidewalks. The consensus emerged from uh, our research, make people feel safe riding on the streets and uh, they will stop using sidewalks. The best way to do that is what makes our number one recommendation, which is here, allocate protected space for micromobility, create protected and connected network for micromobility by calming traffic or by creating dedicated spaces. I insist on the word uh, protected here. Uh, this report calls for physical protection. This could be with uh, planters or with plastic items like that. You can bolt into the ground. 
this image illustrates that it does not always require engineering works. Physical protection here in New York City is based on plastic poles, a line of plastic poles here, combined with the repositioning of the parking lane away from the curb. There is no better protection from vehicles than a lane of parked vehicles. I'll finish with this uh, illustration to show the benefit of a buffer zone between parked vehicle and a bike lane. It prevents crashes against car doors. So are we saying that bike lanes are the solution for e-scooter safety and micromobility safety in general? Yes, we are. Wide, smooth, protected bike lanes where all low-speed micromobility users can mix regardless of the shape or form of their vehicle. But can we still call it a bike lane? Then does it still make sense to use this kind of language? Uh, Technically, yes, because the technical standards remain the same pretty much. But you can also rename or rebrand bike lanes into light individual transport lanes or lit lanes. You will see this term used in recent ITF publications. Now, the debate around e-scooter safety is not limited to bike lanes, of course. Uh, many people believe vehicles are badly designed, badly maintained, or that people are misbehaving. We will come back to that in a minute. Uh, but there is a much more important point to make before that. This is our second recommendation. To make micro-mobility micro safe, focus on, uh, don't focus on micro-vehicles, focus on motor vehicles. The novelty of e-scooters should not distract from addressing the risk motor vehicles impose on other road users. This means better vehicle design, better truck design, better driver education, and so on. In places where vulnerable road users share space with motor vehicles, speed limits should be 30 kilometers or less. The example I'd like to give here, in terms of uh, concrete actions, is that of intelligent speed assistance, uh, otherwise known as ISA. Intelligent speed assistance is an onboard system that helps the driver respect speed limits at all times. It is already available commercially. It will be imposed on all new cars that are sold in Europe and will save many lives. But I'd like to give uh, also a few more tangible examples of what to do uh, on this photo. Do you see any vehicle safety features? Uh, I can see four. Th the driver cabin is low, closer to the ground, closer to street level, good for direct vision of what's happening. The door is entirely uh, transparent so that the driver can see what's happening beside. The vehicle is equipped with mirrors and sensors and side guards uh, preventing the truck from running over people when they're making a turn. Uh, and then I'm not mentioning uh, the potential uh, training that the driver is going through. So how to upgrade entire fleets? Uh, that is the question. How to drive change in the whole industry? One solution, an important one, is procurement. Cities such as London are setting vehicle and driver uh, specification, driver training specification in their procurement contracts. That could be for, for garbage collection, that could be for public works, engineering works, uh, and so on. Our third recommendation is to regulate low speed micro vehicles as bicycles as far as possible. We discussed that earlier. Cities wish to see more people adopt low speed micromobility to reduce pollution and reduce congestion. This will only work if a relatively light touch regulation applies to low speed micro vehicles, such as low speed e-bikes and low speed e-scooters. Recommendation number four, uh, considering that we still know relatively little about micro vehicle safety performance. This report calls uh, for uh, police and hospitals to collect data on micro vehicle uh, crashes, uh, but crash data is not enough. Uh, we need to understand how many trips are made. We call it exposure data, and only with this information can we measure and monitor the risk. So 
road safety agencies should collect trip data via, via operators, via travel surveys, or on-street counts. And of course, we need a common statistical uh, language, a common uh, codification of vehicle types. How to, how to harmonize vehicle types? Uh, police and health services could adopt as a solution a harmonized set of keywords uh, using this poster for example keywords are interesting because they provide some flexibility they can be amended overnight as new vehicles become popular um, in addition to vehicle type uh, please police and health services could uh, note the name of the shared micromobility service provider in their data uh, this is to help link up with available trip data and compute those risk figures. Our second bullet point here is that researchers should not miss the opportunity to compare modes. What do we mean by that? Um, this is when uh, researchers query hospital, police or insurance records in a given city or region. Uh, we, uh, we don't want to to be comparing the safety of one mode in one city with the safety of another mode in a different city. Researchers should query all available transport modes at once. Another recommendation this report is making is to proactively manage the safety performance of the street network. Indeed, uh, shared micro vehicles have motion sensors and GPS units. These can give useful uh, data on potholes, on uh, falls, on uh, near crashes. Authorities and operators should collaborate to use such data. With it, they can uh, diagnose and solve problems on the network before a serious crash has to happen. Training. Uh, this report recommends to include micromobility in, in training for road users. As we discussed earlier, let's not have a narrow focus on micromobility. Motor vehicles are the real source of danger in cities, and this is where training is most needed. Drivers should be trained and tested to avoid crashes with micro vehicles. In addition to that, uh, children should be given the chance to acquire riding skills at school, learning how to navigate in mixed traffic. It is a life skill. It is a skill that is transferable to uh, all types of low speed micro vehicles. The next recommendation is to tackle drunk driving and speeding across all vehicle types. Governments should define and enforce limits on speeding, on alcohol and drug use among all traffic participants. This includes motor vehicle drivers and micro mobility users. In line with recommendation number two, motor vehicles should be the best place to start. So here's something to illustrate that. This is an alcohol interlock system which can be used in uh, drink driver rehabilitation programs. Uh, some are, are actually running in Lithuania and the Netherlands, just to name a few countries. This report also calls for shared mobility operators to eliminate incentives for micromobility riders to speed. Their pricing mechanism should not encourage riders to take risks, just to save a few seconds, a few dollars. By the minute rental can be an incentive to speed or ignore traffic rules, such as pedestrian priority. Alternative charging systems include trip-based and distance-based charges. But why limit this recommendation to micro vehicles? It could inspire new pricing mechanisms in the car sharing sector as well. Recommendation number nine is for manufacturers to improve the design of micro vehicles. The goal is to improve stability and road grip. Solutions could be found in pneumatic tires, in larger wheels, suspensions, uh, changes in the frame geometry. Uh, but beyond that, indicator lights could be made mandatory 
and brake cables be better protected on, on the vehicles which are shared. Uh, why indicator lights? Uh, especially, they could be especially valuable on e-scooters, we think, because you can make hand signals on a bike, on an e-bike, on a self-balancing vehicle, but not on an e-scooter, where a hand signal makes you lose balance or power or both balance and power. The last recommendation from this report is to reduce the risks associated with shared micromobility operations. Uh, operations consist mainly in rebalancing, recharging, and repairs. Vans are often used for this, uh, but they create additional traffic and road danger. This does not make cities more livable. Those vehicles are often parked in unsafe locations. Cities should therefore think about creating loading bays for those vehicles immediately next to the shared mobility docks. But uh, can we reduce the need for such vehicles? Some creative brains have worked on it, uh, but more seriously, operators developed uh, some sustainable solutions using cargo bikes or bicycle trailers. Of course, this doesn't carry as much volume as a van, uh, so the solution is also in reducing the need for logistics. Pricing could encourage uh, self-balancing of the fleet. Uh, batteries could either come in higher capacity uh, so that they are recharged less often, or they could batteries could be swappable, like on this image, or batteries could be simply recharged on the street using such a dock. To read more about uh, this research, go to the ITF website. The report is free for you to download. Uh, and I'll finish with just a few words to explain how we came to these findings and recommendations. As uh, my colleague explained earlier, we held a workshop in Lisbon. Four providers of shared micromobility services joined the discussion. Uh, Bird, SIEC, Green, Envoy, we really thank them for that. We also thank the number of local authorities and national authorities that were present. The research was initiated, funded, and led through the CPB platform. I don't think we mentioned the uh, partners involved in that specific piece of research yet. So they are Bird, Bosch, Green, Incheon, Capsh, Michelin, PTV, Toyota, and Uber. And I'll finish with credits to the ITF Safer City Streets Network, uh, Lisbon for hosting us, Gothenburg, Zurich, and Dublin for attending, Melbourne, London, and a few other cities for responding to some online uh, surveys we conducted. And that's it for this presentation. I will now turn to my colleague Sharon Masterson for a series of question and answer. Thank you, Alex. And uh, as all the participants know, we reached out to you for a number of questions that we could ask um, during this webinar. So we have some of those ready. Um, so Alex, the first question is concerning hybrid vehicles, which are between e-bikes and personal light electric vehicles, such as an e-scooter or swivel seat. The European Commission considers this kind of vehicle as a moped, but some countries consider it as an e-bike. What is the ITF approach on this? And what does ITF consider the minimum requirements for this kind of vehicle? Minimum age, helmet, etc. Right, thank you. Uh, so, well, I hope the presentation makes, makes it clear that uh, this report proposes to regulate micro vehicles on the basis of their kinetic energy rather than their shape or form factor. It is true that e-scooters sometimes come with a seat, uh, but the seat is often removable, creating confusion potentially with regards to regulation. So the, the principle we, we propose in this report is, is very generic. It can uh, come with exceptions. In many countries, the bicycle and the low power uh, pedal assist e-bike benefit from having less regulatory uh, pressure than other vehicles for the same level of kinetic energy. So 
what to think about those exceptions. Uh, they can be challenged on road safety grounds, but exceptions can be legitimate to promote uh, physical activity. Road safety is not the only transport related public health challenge uh, authorities are confronted with. Uh, physical activity is also an important one. So each country is making some tactical moves here. Uh, it depends on the local context. In some countries where the bicycle culture is, is gone, uh, it may well be uh, worth facilitating all forms of low speed electric micromobility so as to accelerate mode shift and uh, resuscitate a, a piece of infrastructure that would, that would be suitable for, for bicycle and all micro vehicles. Now, the, the question uh, you raised was also about uh, a range of regulatory um, dimensions like the age, minimum age. This report does not recommend a specific minimum age. I would uh, recommend consistency with regulations already applicable to uh, comparable vehicles. Comparable vehicles could be throttle powered um, e-bikes reaching similar speeds. Now, uh, other regulations such as helmets. Um, helmet use is mandated in most countries uh, when using low speed electric micro vehicles, but not when using bicycles and, and low speed pedal assist e-bikes. So we could discuss where this different of treatment comes from, uh, kinetic energy being equal. As I said before, it promotes uh, cycling over less physically active options. But it could have negative consequences. It could slow down the uptake of clean micromobility in cities. This report contains many figures on helmet use, uh, which I invite uh, participants to, to search in the report. Uh, driver license, uh, of course, is an important question. Uh, it should not be required for a vehicle traveling at less than 25 kilometers an hour. This is exactly the kind of speeds uh, we want to encourage in cities. Uh, and this is also the speed that the human body can, can run at and can withstand a fall. Uh, public authorities should start with um, the proper enforcement against people uh, driving a car without a license or without an insurance if, if, we, if we start talking about licenses. And I'll finish with uh, insurance. It is an important point. Uh, no pedestrian should be left to pay for the consequences of a crash. This report um, recommends that third party damage cover is imposed on all micro vehicles, uh, even low speed ones, bicycles, e-bikes, e-scooters and others. Vehicle approval process should be similar to what is applicable to e-bikes. Uh, by vehicle approval, I mean vehicle testing. Vehicle testing should be proportionate to, to the mass and to the maximum speed of the vehicle. This is what uh, I, would, I would recommend in, in response to that question. Thank you, Alex. And I understand there were some technical issues just at the beginning and people didn't hear the question. So the question was concerning hybrid vehicles, which are between e-bikes and personal light electric vehicles, um, such as an e-scooter, but with a seat. The Commission considers this kind of vehicle a uh, moped, but most countries, some countries consider it as an e-bike and what was ITF's view on that and also the minimum requirements, which Alex had just gone through. And before we ask, before we, I ask Alex any more questions, what I will say to all of you is that as a follow-up, we will send you the PowerPoint presentation, the questions and the answers to those as well, so you have them all at hand. Now, another question we received, Alex, is why the 1968 Vienna Convention on Road Traffic was not mentioned in this report. Yeah, this is an excellent point. Um, it, it's good we, we involved uh, the, the participants in that webinar. Uh, we cite two pieces of work by the UNECE uh, in this report, uh, but we don't cite the 1968 uh, Vienna Convention. Uh, it is true that the convention sets a number of traffic rules and definitions and those rules and definitions are still binding today in some 80 countries in the world. So I have to admit our focus was on putting 
putting new names onto self-balancing vehicles, uh, self-ways, segways, e-wheels, and unicycles that did not exist at the time. Uh, I must also mention the glossary for transport statistics. This is a joint publication of the UNECE, the ITF, and Eurostat. We, we drew some of our definitions from this document, so I want to give credit to that document too. Okay, great. Um, and now another question, which is uh, very relevant for the moment. Since you have completed and published this report, and I know things are changing all the time, have there been developments in the space of safe micromobility or in micromobility? And if so, could you tell us what these are? Thank you. Uh, so the report was published in February. What happened since February, as you all know, is COVID-19. Um, the, the use of, uh, so not much research has been published since. Uh, the use of shared micromobility services has, has dropped. Uh, I'm talking about shared micromobility services here. It has dropped dramatically uh, due to the COVID situation, due to the fall in, in tourism, due to the fall in, in general mobility in the population. But some operators kept running their services. I hear from DOT and VOI that hospital workers make intense and regular use of the vehicles. Uh, but now that most countries are seeing the end of the lockdown period, it seems that uh, many people will use their private bikes and private e-scooters to avoid public transport on a daily basis. Cities uh, are creating temporary bike lanes for that purpose. Uh, e-scooter sales and bike sales are booming. Uh, e-scooter sales in particular are booming because of their price, uh, they are cheaper than an e-bike. Uh, what are the consequences of all of that for safety? Temporary bike lanes may be good, but may not be of the highest safety standard. They are being designed in a hurry, in a matter of days or a few weeks. Uh, bike lanes which are only painted, painted on the, on the road surface and not physically protected uh, will be interrupted by illegal parking, no doubt about this. They may be more dangerous than having no lane at all. Uh, so along temporary bike lanes, uh, what we encourage local authorities to think about is to lower speed limits to 30 kilometers an hour or to 20 kilometers an hour uh, to speeds that are compatible with um, a rapid rise in the number of people using micromobility, micromobility as a whole. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, we've had a couple of questions online as well. We probably won't get to them all, but maybe we'll be able to take one or two. Um, one was on the question of whether, whether the ITF would recommend limiting the number of bicycles and scooters as a policy or not. Mm, well, I think sit, some cities are, are limiting the number of, of um, I would say, shared, shared micro vehicles. Uh, but what's the rationale for that? It, it could be that they do not have the, um, the parking space for those vehicles. They, they, do not, they are not ready for such a rapid uh, change in mobility patterns. Um, but over time, uh, over time, I don't see the economic rationale for a cap on vehicle numbers. Uh, and let's remember that uh, we're talking about safety here. And uh, safety-wise, uh, if our conclusion is that e-scooters, shared bikes, bikes are, are just very safe ways of getting around the city, uh, I don't see that safety could be a reason to limit the number of those vehicles. Okay, thank you. And another one um, asking about how significantly higher is the risk of hospitalization um, of e-scooters versus bikes? Now, you mightn't have that figure in your head, but is that something we've addressed in the report? Yes. Yes, uh, I would say all, all the figures are in the report, but these are 
there, there are very few data sources. So uh, to be statistically correct, the, the best thing I could say today is that it is significantly higher. How, how much higher? We, we, we can't know for sure. We don't know for sure. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, and for those of you who have written in questions uh, that we haven't answered at this stage, what we'll do is we'll summarize those after the webinar and send them to you as well with the presentation and the questions that we have answered. So those of you who have written into us with questions, um, you won't miss out on the questions and nor will the rest of the attendees. We'll, we'll finalize those and get those back to you. Um, so thank you, Alex, for answering the questions and answers and thank you for the presentation today. Uh, I think it's uh, great that we've had so many people online where we've people online and joining us from from really all over the world, from Australia to China, um, right across Europe and all countries and continents, really. Um, I should mention that the next publication, this is, as Alex has mentioned, one of our corporate partnership board publications. We are working currently on a number of publications that will come out over the coming months that may also be of interest to you, looking as well at the topic of safe micromobility. One of those is looking at the life cycle analysis of new mobility. So looking at the environmental performance of all of these vehicles. Another one on reshaping city streets. And for that report, we have used the data from the city of Dublin. So thank you to them for that. That will look at how new mobility is being integrated into our normal uh, city and how we're planning the city of the future, uh, looking at the usage going ahead. And we'll also take into account um, any insights we have from our current experiences with COVID and with our, that, our, uh, that we can get from data and we'll be reaching out for more data on that. Um, so giving insights from that. We have another one also on blockchain uh, in the supply chain that will be coming out in, in September. The one on the environmental impacts of the micromobility will come out in June and we'll hold another webinar for that. Uh, and then we, our colleagues are writing a message to you at the moment and you should receive that with links as well to all of the publications that we've spoken about. And not only that, but the rest of the publications from the International Transport Forum. As we mentioned, we work across all modes of transport uh, globally. So we're doing quite a lot of work and including on the impacts that we're currently seeing on COVID-19 and statistics on uh, impacts on demand, etc. You'll find that on the homepage of our website. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you to our author, Alexandre Santacreu, for joining us and giving us this interesting presentation. Thank you to our Secretary General, Jung Tae Kim, for his opening remarks at the beginning. Thank you to our colleagues, Dominique Bouquet, Maya Camacho, and Emer Grant for working hard in the background to bring this to you. And for me, Sharon Masterson, I wish you a good day and thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye.